This module will cover the two major emerging diseases of amphibians, chytridiomycosis and rhinovirus. This module is intended for veterinarians. While the information may help to educate non-medical personnel about the purposes of various procedures, the practice of veterinary medicine and the performance of the techniques described should be reserved for licensed veterinarians only. It should also be noted that all of the photographs in the presentations were obtained during routine clinical procedures as veterinarians were caring for ill amphibians. The most well-known emerging infectious disease of amphibians is chytridiomycosis. Recognized since the 1990s, this disease has caused widespread mortality in both captive and free-ranging populations. It is a major threat to fragile amphibian populations, particularly in Australia and Latin America, and is a leading cause of worldwide amphibian population declines. In fact, many ex situ amphibian propagation programs have been instituted to try to protect amphibian species from this threat as it spreads around the world. The disease is caused by the chytrid fungus Batrachochytridium dendrobatidis, often called BD. Fungi in this phylum are most often found free living in soil and water. They have historically been known to be pathogens of plants, other fungi, and invertebrates, but BD is the only species known to be a vertebrate pathogen. The life cycle of the fungus is fairly simple as sexual reproduction has not been seen. The flagellated zoospores grow into a thallus which produces a single sporangium. The sporangium creates new zoospores which exit the sporangium through a papilla and the cycle is repeated. This cycle can occur in the environment without the presence of a host. The fungus can grow at a range of temperatures, but optimal temperatures are 17 to 25 degrees Celsius. Exposure to higher than 30 degrees is lethal. The pathogenesis is not completely understood, but it is thought that the flagellated zoospore is the primary means of dispersal. The zoospore directly invades the amphibian skin, particularly the ventral surfaces where the animal touches the ground. The organism is a primary pathogen and does not need abrasion in the skin or other infectious agents present to be pathogenic. The fungus degrades keratin and so targets the keratinized anatomy of the amphibian. In larvae, the only keratinized structures are the mouth parts. In adults, the infection is limited to the keratinized layer of the skin. The skin reacts with hyperplasia of keratinocytes and results in a breach of the integrity of the skin. As amphibians rely on their skin for respiration, excretion, and water balance, any insult to the skin can be life-threatening. Recent research suggests this fungus appears to cause death by inducing electrolyte imbalances. Clinical signs are frequently nonspecific and the most common presentation is sudden death. If the disease takes a longer course, you may see anorexia and lethargy. More specific signs may include increased shedding, changes in skin coloration, or a reluctance to move and hunched posture to avoid substrate contact with the ventrum. Secondary bacterial infections are also common. The amphibian chytrid fungus has very low host specificity as demonstrated by identification in over 200 species and 20 families representing both anurins and caudates. It should be noted here that not all amphibian species are equally susceptible to the fungus. There are many species that can become colonized by BD and show no clinical signs. These animals then act as inapparent carriers and may spread the disease to species that are susceptible. Antimortem diagnosis may be possible with cytologic examinations of skin scrapings or shed skin. An unstained wet mount of scrapings may reveal the characteristic thalli of this fungus. Cytology of skin impression smears or scrapings stained with typical hematology stains such as right stain may also reveal the thalli within the skin cells. Both of these techniques are rapid and can be done in most basic veterinary labs, but neither is very sensitive. Postmortem diagnosis is made via histopathology. The pathogen can be observed within the keratinocytes, both with and without the use of special stains. More importantly, however, other changes of the skin in reaction to the infection can be evaluated. In animals that are affected by BD, there should be hyperkeratosis, epidermal hyperplasia, and various degrees of inflammation, 
in addition to the presence of spores. Remember that some species may be inapparent carriers, so the presence of BD found via PCR during a mortality event does not necessarily mean that the animals died of BD. For that reason, it is important to have both PCR and histopathology tools available when investigating a disease outbreak in any population. The recommended antemortem test to identify the fungus in both clinically ill amphibians and non-apparent carriers is PCR. There are currently a number of PCR tests available, but the most sensitive appears to be real-time PCR. This video demonstrates one method for collecting samples to submit for PCR. Note that a plastic handled cotton tip swab is being used as wooden handles can interfere with the PCR test. In this case, as the frog is so small, it is being restrained in a small plastic container. Attempts are made to swab the ventrum of the frog where the most spores of BD will be if they are present. In very small species, encouraging them to walk on the applicator may be enough to collect the sample. In larger frogs, care should be taken to swab all areas of the frog that touch the ground, including the feet, ventral legs, drink patch, and ventral abdomen. The swab may then be air dried, placed in a cryo tube, and broken off without touching additional portions of the swab handle. To avoid contamination, new gloves should be worn for each individual and new plastic containers used. The most conservative approach to sampling is to sample each individual frog and then test them individually. However, in most practical situations, frogs are living in groups and a positive result in any one individual will likely result in treatment for the entire group or room. In addition, individual testing may quickly become expensive. There are two methods for pooling samples to help reduce these costs. Individuals may be swabbed with one swab each and then the swabs may be pooled at the lab for testing. This minimizes the chances of spreading the infection but also dilutes the sample dramatically when samples are pooled in the lab, possibly leading to false negative results. In my practice, we will swab three to five individuals who live in the same tank with the same swab and then submit that swab for testing. Using this method, the sample is not diluted for testing. This method does carry a risk of spreading the fungus within the group, but if it is present, the enclosure is already contaminated, the frogs are already sharing the infection, and we will need to treat the whole tank or shipment if any individual is positive. Postmortem sampling is performed in a similar manner. The entire ventrum of the animal can be swabbed. Alternatively, some labs may accept tissue samples for PCR. The most commonly used treatment is a 0.1% solution of itraconazole administered as a 5 to 10 minute bath once a day for 10 days. However, there are significant species and life stage differences in the ability to tolerate antifungal medication. Tadpoles may be killed using this concentration of itraconazole. If there is no experience with a specific medication in a species or life stage, it is advisable to first treat a small number of individuals to evaluate safety before treating a whole group of animals. Note that some animals will react when placed in the treatment solution and try to escape from the bath, which may reflect skin irritation. If extreme reactions are noted, buffering the solution or use of a lower concentration of itraconazole solution should be considered. Because the chytrid fungus persists in the environment, it is important that animals are placed into a chytrid-free enclosure after every treatment. It is helpful to have two sets of enclosures and cage furniture that are alternated between days of treatment. Biosecurity during treatment is important. The chytrid fungus has been shown to survive in deionized water for three to four weeks, sterilized lake water for seven weeks, and moist river sand for three months. However, infective zoospores are very susceptible to desiccation, therefore transmission usually requires moist or wet materials and tools or direct animal contact. Samples for PCR testing should be obtained two weeks after the end of treatment. This allows animals to finish shedding skin that might contain inactivated or dead chytrid organisms that will show up on the PCR test. To be sure the infection is cleared, it is recommended that animals are tested two to three times post-treatment over a two-week period. Treatment can be repeated if unsuccessful the first time. Field application of the itraconazole treatment protocol can easily be done and can increase survival of animals from a BD-positive environment 
that are being collected for conservation assurance colonies. Animals that are BD positive when captured may rapidly develop clinical illness due to stress-induced immunosuppression. Those animals that are captured on the first day of a multi-day expedition may be especially at risk of developing disease by the time they are all brought back to the holding facility. In known BD positive regions, beginning the treatment protocol within the first 24 hours of capture can markedly increase overall survival rates. Other treatments have shown some success. Chloramphenicol at a concentration of 20 mg per liter delivered as a continuous bath for two to four weeks has shown promise, but few studies have been performed. Also, caution and gloves should be used when using chloramphenicol because it is known to cause irreversible aplastic anemia in humans that are sensitive to the drug. Elevated constant prolonged environmental temperature greater than 30 degrees Celsius may be effective in treating chytrid. This method has shown promise in both terrestrial and aquatic species. It is important to slowly increase and then maintain a constant temperature rather than subjecting the animals to rapid temperature changes. Note that many amphibians may not be tolerant of these temperatures and this treatment should be used cautiously in novel species. We'll now move on to talk about rainavirus. Rainaviruses have been documented to have caused mass mortalities of free-ranging amphibian populations. In one study, rainavirus was implicated in nearly half of all mortality events from 1996 to 2001. These viruses have also been reported to have caused mortality events in captive collections. The role of rainavirus in captive collections is relatively newly recognized, and so there are many questions still about its prevalence and the significance to different collections. However, given the reported outbreaks and the potential for non-affected carrier animals, the virus merits close attention. When people refer to rainavirus, they are generally referring to a group of related viruses in the Iridoviridae family. Three major groups within the rainavirus category are of concern to amphibians. The frog virus 3-like viruses have affected anurans, but also have been isolated in some turtles and salamanders. The ambistoma, trigrinum-like viruses, affect salamanders, but have been transmitted experimentally to anurans. The Bole iridovirus has been shown to affect anurans and fish. Further complicating the matter, the host range in pathogenesis varies by strain. With viruses like these that can have a broad host range and such varying effects on different hosts, there is a large potential for transmission of strains that may be non-pathogenic for some animals in a collection or particular geographic region, but lethal to others. The virus typically affects tadpoles, but can affect adults as well. Clinical signs are generally nonspecific and can include skin hemorrhages, ulcerations, visceral hemorrhage, and edema. These signs are similar to those seen in red leg or septicemia. Historically, outbreaks of such signs may have been diagnosed as bacterial septicemia, but recent work suggests that rainavirus and other infections may be more involved in such mortalities than was previously thought. Some animals may show no outward signs and either carry the virus or clear it without becoming ill. Unfortunately, there is no effective treatment. Diagnosis in live animals may be difficult. Many labs may run a PCR test on samples such as swabs, scrapings, or discharges obtained from a live frog, but the results should be interpreted with caution. A negative result does not necessarily mean the animal does not have the virus, as the tests are designed for tissues and the virus may not be present in the types of samples easily obtained from live animals. A positive result in light of compatible clinical signs may be significant, but it is probably not helpful in healthy specimens. Diagnosis on postmortem samples may include both PCR of tissue samples and histopathology to confirm the presence of compatible lesions, including viral inclusion bodies. A viral culture can be performed, but most labs do not have the proper cell lines and environmental parameters to culture these viruses well. As there is no treatment and the outbreaks can be very harmful to captive collections, biosecurity and isolation is important, particularly during an outbreak. Standard quarantine procedures and appropriate hygiene can help minimize the impacts of this disease. Please see the biosecurity module for further discussion of this topic. During an outbreak, the approach will vary by the situation. Highly valuable specimens may enter a permanent quarantine situation. Culling affected animals may be appropriate. And selective culling to test for the virus after an outbreak appears to have run its course 
may also be a means for deciding if it is safe to move animals and continue with the planned program. A number of useful references regarding amphibian infectious diseases are listed here, particularly the Amphibian Disease Manual. Thank you for your attention and good luck with your future amphibian projects.